The lion will fight the dragon on the field of poppies. Burn them all! Where's my sister? What? The lion will fight the dragon on the field of poppies. The English lion will fight the dragon on the field of poppies. I'm playing about a bit. Here we are at episode 3 of Rain. We've got 75 to go, Alan. Do you get, do you hear that, baby? 75 to go. There is trouble on the Scottish border. The English are approaching Scotland and it looks like they're going to wage war. I don't know if that's true. I'm not sure if Mary the first ever waged war on Scotland. Mary! Insistence of her husband Philip II, she attacked France, and that's how they lost Calais. Um, one thing that they do get right in the episode is that the English still have Calais for now. They might introduce the loss of Calais later into the first series. That that might change the whole plot point of everything. But I, I don't know yet, obviously, because um, I want to be surprised. I'm going into these episodes blind. Do not tell me the spoilers. Scotland need troops from France. King Henri II is refusing to do so, despite Francois's pleas, and and Mary finds that the only person willing to give her the troops she needs to save Scotland is Thomas, the bastard son of the King of Portugal, who is soon going to be legitimised by his father and become the new Prince of Portugal. So with Francois and Mary's engagement in an indefinite stalemate at, the t at this time, Mary decides she must break her engagement with Francois against her will even though because she is falling in love with Francois and must marry Portugal. She's doing this for her country. So on the bright side it shows that Mary is putting her country above all things. However this engagement to Thomas t stirs up a lot of drama mainly because her lady-in-waiting Germaine has a crush on Thomas and thinks that she actually had a chance to marry him because he's a bastard and though she is rich she is not titled. So he was a good target to marry in order to advance her family's standing. And when Germaine finds out that Thomas actually fancies Mary, she's broken hearted and she falls for a kitchen boy instead. Meanwhile, three of the four Marys are given prophecies by Nostradamus, as well as Mary herself. So Amy is told that she will never go home. And you know, while Nostradamus' prophecy to Susan is a bit blasé, that might end up coming to fruition because he was told to give her a prophecy under duress. So that might not come true, but he says, you will fall in love with a dark haired man, be wary of flattery. Will that come to fruition later in this season? I don't know yet, we'll find out. Jermaine is told you will fall in love with a man with a white mark on his face. Ah, so this was the episode where I realised that either they couldn't be bothered to train the actors to fight or ride horses or dance or they just didn't have the time or money because this is a season one and season ones have very uncertain budgets because they have to make sure that this will be successful enough for a second season. So there are so many things they can't do even though they want to. The first one I noticed, like you're going to see this a lot because there are a lot of sword fights, um, at least in the next few episodes alone. Henri, Francois and Bassi do a sparring match um, in the throne room. I think it was a throne room or it was Henri's parlour. I, I don't know, these rooms all look the same. And the scene opens with Bassi and Henri fighting because Henri will spar with Bassi because Bassi is not his heir and he actually prefers Bassi over all his other kids. And it's so choppy, it's just like swirl, fung, cut, 
swung fur cut swing fur. It's very much a habit of certain TV shows and films to hide the fact that these actors don't actually know how to fight in certain stage combat. They do all these cuts to make it look like an exciting fight scene and um, obviously I've been spoiled a lot because I've been watching Star Wars because in like, just just in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series alone yeah you had a really good coverage of Ewan McGregor swing around his lightsaber like swinging it around like that although this is the reverse grip that uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi does not do reverse grip that's Ahsoka Tano's work but uh, it was amazing showing him doing all those uh, lightsaber forms <laughs> And also fighting against uh, Hayden Christensen again, like seeing that, like that is a huge treat. You also see great sword combat on The Witcher with um, Henry Cavill. Uh, Henry Cavill is actually swinging around his broadsword a lot of the time. There are a few times when they cut two stunt doubles, but they're very good at hiding the faces. <laughs> I think even the Tudors had a few good fight scenes because like there's a uh, there's a, the French invasion scenes um not the French invasion scenes that the siege of Bologna scenes uh there is a bit where the camp is nearly ambushed by the French and Suffolk who was also played by uh, Henry Cavill and the Earl of Surrey they all they, they get into a fight scene and that was that fight scene was okay, um, and of course you yeah, Lord of the Rings, you got uh, Viggo Mortensen actually wanted to bring a proper sword onto the set so it actually looked like, so the weight of it was real. But um, yeah, in this it's, just, it's, the laziness is very clearly seen, if you know what to look for you can see it. Same can be said with the dance scene later on, Thomas is obviously, he's showing off to the court, he's being very audacious in front of them and trying to seduce Mary with a dance from from the Portuguese court which involves a lot of lifting and facing it was like dances that face each other in the 16th century no but they hide that these two aren't actually good at dancing by uh, cutting every which way to make it look like it's a sexy seductive dance but it's it's just like I can see what you're doing Patrick Swayze, he ain't. There is a scene round about the middle of the episode where Mary thinks that she's going off with Thomas to make a diplomatic meeting to try and get Portugal to help Scotland. And they do this by riding out alone together to this place, this ruined church or something like that, where he will eventually end up proposing to her. And it's just him and Mary, and I could very much question the safety of the Scottish Queen riding out alone with no guards as an escort with a bastard from the port court of Portugal who very who may very well want to isolate her because he might be in the pay of England. However, what distracted me the most was realising I had bitched about something similar like this in my last Becoming Elizabeth vlog. You remember how um, back in Becoming Elizabeth, there was a riding scene between Elizabeth and Mary and then I went into a whole tangent about how you can tell when an actor isn't actually riding the horse with certain things like filming them close up, like you can't see the head of the horse because the horse is being clearly led along by an animal handler or, or um, their pinkies aren't outside the reins like they should be. Just in case you haven't seen it, when you're riding a horse, yeah, your instinct might be to ride a horse like a pair of handlebars, uh, but actually it's different than that. You're supposed to hold it like so, so it's easier to pull in the reins, so you have more tension in the reins and you have to tuck your pinkies outside of the reins. I don't know why but I guess that helps with the grip. Basically if they're even they're not holding the reins the right way you can tell that this person does not know how to ride. So um, during this riding scene Mary is shown very close up, you can't see the head of the horse, her hair is very faintly blowing in the wind like as if there's just like a f massive fan on her. Okay, <laughs> I'll just get my giant fan out. Yeah, imagine if like there was just massive fan on her like that, and her hair was blow like obviously bigger than this, and uh, her hair was blowing in the breeze. But it's not the mass, not because horses can go quite fast when when they want to, so her hair should be like 
all ratty and shit, but they had to make Adelaide Kane look pretty. All the zoomed out shots of them riding, you can't see Mary's face because obviously that's not her riding. And then on the brief shot where you actually see Adelaide Kane on the horse, so basically she's holding the reins as if she's holding a rope. Why am I always so petty and have to demonstrate things? She's holding the reins like that. So either Adelaide Kane can't ride a horse or she can ride a horse, but the producers thought it wasn't worth the risk actually putting their actress on the horse for this sort of thing because um, she is wearing a very long dress and a cape and if that's swaying in the breeze that's going to scare the horse. If you have never ridden a horse before, if you're wearing a coat you have to do up the coat. Anything flapping is going to scare the horses. Horses are very skittish. Yeah, did I just go on a huge rant about horse riding again? Anyway, I really should uh, move on and talk about something else. Let's talk about Henri and Kenna. Kenna is still um, not ready to sleep with the king yet. She thinks that Henri is getting back at her for not sleeping with him by moving on to other women and she is told by Mary, I don't think she's told by Mary, she's told by Bassey that he's very mercurial and he usually, he sees a woman and he just moves on to another one and another one and another one. Of course Henri II had uh, quite a few bastards of his own, none of them with Diane de Poitiers, so yeah Bassey didn't exist but um, she goes and mopes about it to Bassey, see himself as probably moping about Mary. But he looks as if he went to ye old liquor store to go and get his bottle of malt because it even looks like it's in a paper bag like you know how you see in uh, movies like they've drunks put their booze in paper bags so the cops can't see. This isn't alcohol, I stopped drinking recently. It's just LucasAid. I'm not sponsored by LucasAid if anyone needs to know. Ailey is still pretty much irrelevant to everything and anything to do with the plot. Uh, Susan is just a background character in this as well. When it comes to the four Marys in this um, episode, it's mostly surrounding Kenna and Jermaine. At the start of the episode, Jermaine um, is pressured into talking about her first kiss with the other girls and she says, I haven't kissed anyone yet. My first kiss is in the very near future. I'm not like you. My family's not titled. I can't afford even little mistakes. Because I'm not from a noble family, even though the person she's based on, what was it, Mary Beaton. Mary Beaton definitely was from a noble family, but I guess they've just written this in because it's, it's good for drama, I guess. She, uh, she says that um, she fancies Thomas and she is planning that on this night when there's going to be like a, a party on the water she's going to have a picnic with him an idealized picnic she's got it all planned out in her mind and they're going to and she is going to have her first kiss from him unfortunately because thomas turns out is actually after mary she is left sitting alone with her untouched picnic basket in the kitchens and a, a boy who works in the kitchen around about the same age as her whom she was quite rude to earlier in the episode uh consults her about it and they go through the the, ki the picnic basket together and he comforts her over her heartbreak and then they end up kissing and uh, of course she's told that you'll fall in love with a man with a white mark on her face she later goes downstairs the next day I think it's to organize it's, all, it's to organize something like Mary's breakfast or whatever and the same boy I never actually learned his name uh, the same boy is right next to the the head chef or the head cook and he's kneading some dough and he's got flour over his hands and then just as Greer walks away after having a nice eye exchange with him they he just smushes his hand and he's got a nice smack of flour over his face so yes that white mark was a lot more innocent than what I thought the white mark would be because <laughs> my mind is in the gutter I mean it's it's a it's sort of um a sweet romantic thing where it's just like these guys are gonna crash and burn I know it and obviously that the whole kiss scene I kind of wish it had been a bit more consensual because <laughs> the whole thing was about kissing finding the perfect kiss and he just pulls her in for a kiss and he's just not like, may I kiss you, my lady? And she's like, oh. Uh, you've got to make the kissing consent a bit more transparent sometimes, guys. Come on. To that, she's not too put out about not having Thomas. There is a scene after the party where they've all got hangovers. Mary comes to see Jermaine and offers her some coffee. Like, this is, like, would you like a cup of this? It's a new 
delicacy from Venice. They call it coffee. Let me check. Was coffee a thing in 1557? 1669. Okay, they're off by at least 110 years. Oh wait, no, I didn't mention the ending of uh, episode 3, which makes Mary reluctantly decide they're going to marry Portugal. So, during the water party, Francois, after several failed attempts to get his father to send troops to Scotland, eventually convinces him by using Kenna. He basically he backmails his father saying, when your, when your mistress and my mother find out that you've fallen for another girl, how are they going to react to it? Because I don't know how well you are at handling the nagging. And he's just like, mm, now you're thinking like a king. Very well, use Bassi to lead them. Cause, uh, well, use Bassi to go and fetch them because he's the fastest rider. And so Bassi leaves that night, even though he's still pretty drunk. And then and th the next morning, as everyone thinks, oh, everything's going to be fine now. Nothing, no need to worry about anything. And Mary's like, Oh, Francois cares about me. He's what a lovely person. Like, I, I can't wait to marry him. I'm falling more in love with him every day. Then Bassi rides up to the castle and he's been injured because the companies, the, the soldiers, they were attacked because the English came out of Calais and they attacked the companies and Bassi barely made it back to the castle alive. Catherine de Medici is terrified because she find because Nostradamus told her at the beginning of the episode that England's conflict with Scotland will bring warfare within the walls of the French castle and of course that would be Bassey being injured and he is very badly injured indeed. And with that happening, of course Henri is definitely not going to send out any more soldiers because the English seem to know that the that France was going to help. So, Mary's like, shit, well, I guess I'm going to have to marry Portugal then. And then as these Portuguese troops leave, Mary sees the sigil, the flag on the boat, which I later found out is actually um, Thomas's personal seal because he's a bastard, as bastards can pick whatever seal they like. And it's a, it's a dragon and she realises, oh, the lion will fight the dragon on the field of poppies because that was a prophecy Nostradamus told her saying the lion will fight the dragon on the field of poppies and she thinks it's the, the lion of England will fight um, the dragon of Portugal in the field of poppies which I guess counts as Scotland. If, if, if I was thinking if that was the case shouldn't you have said the, the, the field of thistles? You know the, the thistles, the flower of Scotland Will we see your like again? And yeah, that's pretty much all the events I could cover in uh, episode three of Rain. So, what was the worst dress in this episode? It was Greer's titty ruffle corset dress. For those of you who haven't actually seen the episode, I'll explain. So while Jermaine is preparing for the picnic, uh, she is going through a list of things she wants and that's how we first meet the kitchen boy and she's being very snooty, very snobby. I want strawberries this late in the year and he's like, I can't do strawberries, I can do you apples. Chestnut spread, strawberry tartlets. Strawberries this late, uh, I can make you apple tarts. Everyone has apple. I wanted something different. Talk to God, he put the strawberries away. Fine. You want an awful lot? This must be for someone special. Not that it's any of your business, but yes. It's for someone very special. And she's, and then he's just like, look, just give me the list and I'll sort it for you. And she says, oh, well, how will you read it? How will you know what's on it? Because obviously illiteracy. She's wearing this really silly looking dress. Um, she's got a corset over it. It looks like a waistcoat corset. It's fur lined. And then right down in the cleavage, let's just, let me demonstrate this. Right down in the cleavage, she's got this embarrassing ruffle as if she stuck a napkin down there. And it looks kind of like... It's basically like she did that. She's got a titty ruffle. And it looks it looks ridiculous. Like it, I probably would have chosen another dress if I hadn't been that bloody ruffle. It might... I, I, I mean, I still would have chosen uh, Jermaine for it because during the water party she's wearing just... Um, a strapless prom dress with a bit of fur lining around the titties. What is it with you and your titties, Jermaine? 
It's almost as if you want Robert Baratheon to say, God bless Jermaine and her tits. Yeah, that was episode three of Rain. Some of these dresses, oh my god. I mean, I very nearly gave the worst dress to Mary in that scene where she's dancing with Thomas because it looks like one of the rejected dress designs for Attack of the Clones. Yeah, I said it. Ugh. It looked like Natalie Portman was going to wear that and she just thought, no, that looks stupid. <laughs> thank you guys for watching. Please make sure that you subscribe for the next one. A big thank you to my patrons who are supporting the channel. For Duke and Duchess and King and Queen patrons, they can see the first 11 vlogs already up on Patreon right now. And even just signing up to be a patron for £1 or $1.50 per creation, you will get your name in the credits in practically every video that I make. And of course, to my King and Queen patrons, thank you very much, Alison Cuff, Larissa, Lady Eternal, Leslie Williams, and Jill My Nero. You guys are great. Uh, next one, uh, yes. The next one, we get a resolution to all this Portugal stuff, and you will sit back in your chair at the end of the episode and realise, well, that was pointless. <laughs>